We have to dig, we have to investigate. And if it takes getting dirty and wet and cold and miserable and smelly, I don't care. I want an answer. A drone just scanned Oak Island using ground penetrating radar. What it found should not be there. Deep underground, far below any known dig, appeared large hollow chambers, perfectly shaped and deliberately hidden. Experts say these structures are not natural. So the mystery is no longer what is buried on Oak Island. But why someone went to such extreme lengths to hide it? Stay till the end, because the final discovery changes everything. Subscribe now for more hidden mysteries revealed. Let's found out. The Ghost Signal The search for the truth on Oak Island has always been a battle against the elements. But recently, the War Room shifted its strategy from brute force to advanced technology. While the Money Pit has been the center of attention for over 200 years, the team realized that the answers might not be in the deep shafts, but in the surrounding waters that hug the coastline. This is where things get interesting. Rick, Marty, and the team commissioned a high-tech magnetometer survey to scan the northern waters. There are the anomalies supplied to us from CSR. The reason for the dive, obviously, is to try to explain those two mystery targets up there. Yep, exactly. And that's the Frog Island Shoal one. As you can see, there's a number of targets around the island, but those are probably the two most interesting. They should be. They weren't just looking for scattered coins. They were hunting for massive iron signatures that would indicate something significant, something industrial or military left behind by the original depositors. The results were immediate and baffling. The scan lit up with a massive anomaly near Frog Island, a small landmass just off the coast of Oak Island. This wasn't a small blip or a false positive from a dropped fishing net. This was a six-foot linear feature buried under the ocean floor. Now you might think, so what? It's the ocean, and there's junk down there. But here is the catch. This specific area, known as the Frog Island Shoal, is treacherous. It is a place where ships would naturally avoid unless they were being steered there on purpose. The data suggested a large concentration of ferrous metal, the kind you would find in cannons, anchors, or the iron fasteners of a massive sailing vessel. To verify this groundbreaking data, the team called in heavy hitters, diver Tony Sampson and renowned underwater archaeologist Dr. Lee Spence. Spence is a legend in the field having discovered over 100 shipwrecks and millions in treasure. When a guy like that looks at a squiggly line on a graph and gets excited, you know it is serious. He didn't mince words. He looked at the magnetic hits and the location and immediately identified it as a potential shipwreck site. This area up here, if I had done this magging and I saw these targets, I would think, okay, looks like we have one or two shipwrecks right here. That's great. The theory is that a ship didn't just crash here. It might have been scuttled or sunk to hide the evidence of what was offloaded onto Oak Island. The dive itself was a masterclass in frustration and suspense. The water depth was shallow, only about 19 to 20 feet, but the visibility was a nightmare. The bottom was covered in thick vegetation and silt. As Tony and Dr. Spence swam the grid, their handheld scanners were screaming. They were getting hits, big ones. But every time they reached down to feel the source, they were met with layers of mud and kelp. They were drifting directly above history, yet they couldn't recognize it. The scanners verified a massive metallic object hidden beneath the silt. But without permission to excavate, they couldn't disturb the ground to reveal the iron. It was the ultimate frustration. The spirit of a ship was right there, confirmed by instruments, yet physically completely out of reach. Buried Leviathan. While the crew was pursuing ghosts along the shoreline, an even larger mystery was unfolding back on land, deep inside the swamp. For decades, the triangular swamp has sparked countless theories. Some believe it was artificially created. 
Others insist it contains the secret behind the water traps. But two years earlier, a seismic scan shifted everything. The results exposed a 200-foot-long anomaly buried far beneath the sludge. It wasn't natural stone. It showed the unmistakable curved outline of a sailing vessel, a ship trapped inside a swamp far from the open sea. It sounds unbelievable, doesn't it? But the deeper they investigate, the more believable it becomes. Billy Gerhardt and the heavy equipment crew advanced into the swamp's southern edge, attempting to intercept the anomaly. They weren't digging randomly. They were guided by data. Then the bucket struck something. It wasn't stone, and it wasn't native island clay. It was wood, but not ordinary wood. They recovered a timber clearly shaped by human hands. It was smooth, refined, and crafted. It looked exactly like a railing from a ship's stern or quarterdeck. Consider what that means for a moment. Finding a ship's railing in a swamp forces a serious question. A ship doesn't simply wander into a swamp and bury itself. That suggests an enormous engineering accomplishment. The theory proposes that centuries ago, the swamp wasn't a swamp at all, but an open harbor. The depositors sailed the ship inside, unloaded the treasure, then sealed the entrance, transforming the harbor into a swamp to conceal the vessel forever. It's the perfect crime. You don't just hide the treasure. You hide the escape vehicle. As Billy kept digging, the excavator bucket began sliding across a massive solid surface buried deep in the mud. He couldn't break through it. It was too smooth and too continuous to be random rock. It felt like a deck or hull. The tension in the swamp was undeniable. They were scraping along the backbone of a buried leviathan. The railing they recovered had a square opening, marking where a wrought iron fastener once sat. This isn't modern trash. This is ancient. The craftsmanship clearly points to the 18th century or earlier. But the swamp pushed back, as always. The dig site walls began collapsing inward. Water levels climbed. They were standing atop a massive wooden structure, holding part of its railing, while the mud consumed the evidence as quickly as they exposed it. It was a race against nature, fire and steel. Physical proof matters, but context matters more. To understand exactly what they were uncovering, the team turned to their secret weapon, blacksmithing expert Carmen Lega. If there's a rusted piece of iron anywhere on Earth, Carmen can tell when it was forged, how it was used, and probably what the blacksmith ate that day. The team presented him with a huge bent iron bolt discovered near the stone pathway inside the swamp. This wasn't a tiny nail. This was a thick steel bar, more than an inch wide, bent into a circular ring. Carmen's analysis was explosive. He didn't focus only on its shape. He studied the metal's condition. He noted that the iron was coated in charcoal. It hadn't merely rusted. It had been burned. And this wasn't from a small fire. The metal had endured extreme high-temperature flames. The iron was still bonded to the charcoal, showing it was attached to wood when it burned. Carmen determined it was a ring bolt from a large sailing ship likely used to secure heavy cargo or cannons. But the burning is crucial. Why would a ship's bolt be burned and then buried in a swamp? This fits disturbingly well with the scuttling theory. If you're a pirate crew, a Templar order, or a military expedition and you want to vanish, you burn your ship. You set it ablaze to destroy the structure, causing it to collapse into water or an engineered swamp, effectively wiping it from the map. The date Carmen provided was even more precise. He placed the artifact between 1710 and 1790. This marks the golden age of piracy and privateering. It aligns perfectly with the timelines of known figures active in the region. The fact that the bolt was found near the stone road, 
a man-made path that strongly resembles a wharf, points to a carefully planned operation. They brought the ship in, unloaded heavy chests using those ring bolts, hauled them across the stone road to the money pit, then burned the ship. It creates an image that's hard to forget. Picture the Oak Island sky three centuries ago, glowing with the fire of a burning galleon while men labored in darkness to hide a fortune. The evidence is no longer just digital lines on a screen. It's a heavy, scorched piece of iron that witnessed destruction firsthand. The force required to bend such solid steel speaks to either desperation or absolute determination. Whoever was here didn't want anyone to know they arrived, and they definitely didn't want to be followed when they left. The Captain's Log The 1700s timeline brings one name into sharp focus. Captain James Anderson. He was a privateer, an Oak Island landowner, and a man with a deeply mysterious history. Recently, the team examined his sea chest, a physical connection to the man who may sit at the center of this mystery. The chest itself was rich with history, but its link to these new discoveries is what's truly strengthening the theory. When Gary Drayton and the team uncovered a massive ship spike in the spoils, it added another crucial puzzle piece tied directly to this period. The spike was enormous, rose-headed, and hand-forged. This wasn't meant for a small boat. It belonged to a ship capable of crossing oceans. The spike's size reflects the timber's size, and the timber's size reflects the ship's tonnage. We're talking about a vessel built to carry serious weight. Gold, silver, relics. The connection to Captain Anderson is compelling because it adds a person to the evidence. A mid-17th century privateer would have had both motive and opportunity to hide wealth. Privateering was essentially government-approved piracy during wartime. These ships captured enemy vessels and seized cargo. But if you took something you didn't want to report to the Crown, or if you were saving treasure for later, an uninhabited island off Nova Scotia would be the perfect vault. The spike Gary found dates to the same era as the burned bolt Carmen analyzed. It also matches the time frame of the ship's railing Billy uncovered. Every line of evidence points to a single moment, or series of moments, in the 18th century. It shifts the mystery away from hazy legends of ancient Romans or Vikings and places it firmly in an era of naval conflict and hidden wealth. The captain's log of this mystery is being written in corroded iron and decaying wood. And this is where it becomes even more compelling. If Anderson or someone similar was involved, they weren't simply digging holes. They were constructing infrastructure. The stone road, the wharf, the flood tunnels. These are not the efforts of a handful of men with shovels. This is military-level engineering. The ship spike is just one fastener in an enormous construction project. It implies the ship wasn't merely a transport vessel. It was part of the design. Perhaps the ship itself was used as part of the structure, its hull serving as a coffer dam or barrier before being burned and buried. The deeper they investigate, the more it appears the ship is central to the trap system itself. The final barrier. So now we have the ghost signal of a wreck near Frog Island. We have the seismic anomaly of a ship in the swamp. We have the physical railing, the burned bolt, and the massive spike. The picture has never been clearer, yet the final barrier remains. The island itself is the ultimate protector. Every time the team approaches the truth, conditions worsen. The swamp floods. Silt clouds the diver's vision, and the seasons shift, bringing winter storms that shut the operation down. The dive team confirmed that to properly identify the Frog Island wreck, they must move Earth. They need an excavation permit, and that is a bureaucratic nightmare. 
You can't disturb the ocean floor without proving something is there. But you can't prove it's there without disturbing the ocean floor. It's a catch-22 meant to safeguard history. In this case, though, it's delaying a discovery of the century. They need a cannon, a coin, or a timber to break through the silt and get approval. In the swamp, the obstacle is depth and stability. The excavator can only dig so far before the walls give way. The anomaly sits at a depth that stretches the limits of standard excavation. They know it's there. They can feel it with the bucket. But uncovering it intact would require a massive coffer dam to drain the swamp and dig dry. That means millions of dollars and months of work. But the reward would be a colonial-era sailing ship buried in the heart of an island. It would rewrite maritime history. The team now faces a heavy choice. The data is undeniable. The small artifacts are teasing something enormous. But the real prize, the ship itself, still lies behind the final wall of mud and red tape. They've barely scratched the surface, yet they've uncovered clues proving the legends are real. A ship came here. It carried something incredibly valuable. It was destroyed to hide the secret, and it's still down there waiting. As the season changes and the weather closes in, the team knows they are on the edge of a breakthrough. The scanners have done their part. They've revealed the unseen. Now it's up to human hands to break the ground and expose the truth. The Oak Island mystery is no longer about whether something is down there. It's about what it is and how they can retrieve it without the island taking another life. The fleet is buried. The trap is armed. And time is running out. The scanners don't lie. A fleet rests beneath the mud, and the signs of a massive cover-up keep growing. But with government restrictions and a hostile swamp, can they reach the ship before the island claims victory again? Or was this fleet destined to remain buried forever? Hit like if you believe the gold is still there, and subscribe to see what the next scan uncovers.